What happens when the world gets turned on its head? We're forced to look inward, perhaps become fearful, sometimes lash out at others. While there are others in the world who don't give up hope because they believe in people. Join me, Kevin Tibbles and Amy Goldberg, for our new podcast, Believe in People, where we meet those who don't give up hope. When it comes to music and the music industry, there aren't many people who can compete with my pal, David Fishaw. He's an encyclopedia. He's a promoter. He's a friend to the stars. And above all, a lover of music. David is also perhaps the oldest camp counselor in the world. Yes, David now runs the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, where would-be rock stars gather with real rock stars to learn and jam. And in fact, Amy, I was a camper myself in New York a few years back. Artists love to give back. They realize their success is based on the fan. And that's how I came up with the idea of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. Well, David, welcome to Believe in People. Thanks for being with us. Oh, man, it's so great to re be reunited with you and to meet Amy. Make me <laughs> smile. Let's start off just by asking a question about music. How long have you been in the music industry? I mean, you started as a kid in a band. I would say 17, um, and I'm going to be 67. So uh, there that's you go. About, Do the math. Uh, that, wow. Wow, that's a long <laughs> time. And then yet, 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 viewers and listeners, David started off as a sports agent and transitioned into being a music promoter, which is fascinating. And uh, he's a son of a cantor. So I'm like, there's so many questions to ask. I'm so excited. So, <laughs> <laughs> David, how did you transition from a very well-known and well-respected sports agent to the, uh, getting into the music industry, apart from your well, love of music? So it was a while I was doing the, the sports. Um, I was representing some amazing athletes, uh, like Phil Sims, a quarterback of the Giants. And I had the whole, many of the offensive linemen and, and, um, eight of the Giants and, um, and Lou Pinella, the Yankees. And, um, it, it was wonderful to be a sports agent, but, you know, I was losing the creativity of really what's inside of me. And, um, you know, because if you see the movie, show me the money, that's what it's about, you know, being a sports agent. So when I got the opportunity, to you know, represent the association, the turtles, and the grassroots, and and then I started doing the monkeys, and and then eventually, you know, I transformed into uh, putting together the Ringo's All Star Band, and then the players started to retire, um, and I wasn't getting new players. I just said, you know what, let me let me go full time into show business. You you talk about uh, putting together things like Ringo's All Star Band, and and and. I mean, I, I do know for a fact you had to tour with them because Ringo insisted that you be there uh, when when he was when he was touring and things. What kind of stuff goes on behind the scenes that people like me just have no idea what's going on? Well, you know, first of all, I I, I when I put these tours together. Um, you're right. I didn't go out all the time. I'd go out a few days here and come right back. Um, but I remember meeting the late, uh, great Bill Graham, who was the, um, probably one of the greatest promoters in the world ever. And, uh, he was a waiter in the Catskills. And in 1986, I used to rehearse, I rehearsed with the Monkees tour up in the Catskills. And I got to spend time with him. Yeah. Bill Graham, he went back every year to the Catskills to eat pickled herring and to hang out with the waiters that he, <laughs> that he grew up with. They were the waiters. So he, you know, he became the biggest rock and roll promoter. And um, so I got to meet with Bill. And I remember one night um, he said, come meet me in the bar. Let's have a, a drink. And I turned to him and he had a few in him. And I said to him, so what do you do for a living? He said, I'm the Rolling Stones tour manager. And I said, but you're Bill Graham. You're my idol. I said, yeah, I know. But who else is going to tell Mick Jagger to get the F on the bus? So he, that's when he taught me that you better go on the road with your artists. And 
And then when I put Ringo's band together and, uh, you know, he, he, he reminded me that, uh, remember you told me you're going to be with me? And I said, yes. I said, but that's agent talk. I don't go on the road. And, um, he said, well, I, you know, I need you out here. And, uh, and he was, he really was right. I was thinking what Bill Graham said, you know, when my shows in Detroit, when my shows in Chicago, when, 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 when the all star band is in, in Des Moines, Iowa, that's where my business is. And that's where I really have to, where, where, where I have to go. I have to be on the road. What happens? Oh, so many crazy things happen. I think the best and the funniest thing happened to me was I was a square kid out there on the road with these, with these folks. And, um, and, um, I had mortgaged my house, um, because I was, when I put Ringo's all star band together, you know, I'm a promoter. That's what we do. We, we, we take chances all day and, uh, we don't play the market. God forbid. No, 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 we take chances. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'm backstage with, um, talking to the president of Radio City Musical. And I said to him, you know, Ringo wants to play Radio City. What do you think? And, you know, they watch a show tonight. I think it'd be perfect. And next thing I know, Clarence Clemens, who was in the band, late Clarence Clemens, walks by my table and he says, David, I've had enough. I'm, a, I'm going home. This is not for me. I said, well, what's going on, Clarence? He said, there's too much fighting going on in this band you put together. You know, I created this all-star band with all these amazing musicians. And people told me it was never going to work. It would work for a one time, you know, benefit concert. You can, you can bring all these people together, but to go on tour with all the different leaders of different bands and you're expecting them to be peaceful. It's never going to work. And then a second later, Nils Lofgren, he walks by and he says, David, I'm out of here. So my heart, <laughs> you know, my heart left me. All I could think was my house going down the river <laughs> in the Hudson River. And, uh, really that was a thought, you know. And, um, so they said to me, you better go and, and you better, you know, see what's going on. And, um, I said, what's going on? I said, well, Levon Helm and Joe Walsh are having a fight and they're fighting over <laughs> song <laughs> together. So I decided I'm going to go down there. First of all, let me go find Ringo because, you know, he's, it's his band, you know, let him, to, let him break up the fighting. What am I going to do? You know, I'm 10 years younger than these guys. I'm the last thing that they're, they're going to listen to. I walk into the security guard. You better go. It's getting get in there. I walk in there and leave one home. He's got a knife in his hand and blood all over his face and his hands. Joe Walsh, he's got a glass bottle and uh, broken, and they're and he's got blood and they're cursing at each other and they're saying, "You know, you ruined my song and this and that." And next thing you know, they pushed me, threw blood at me, and then they both turned around. And they stuck their tongues out at me and. Um, they thought it was funny. <laughs> they thought it was funny, you know, but they had nothing else to do with the world. Let's do a practical joke against David, you know. So I love it. It's, it, it made the film. And, and um, that was your initiation, so, but, David. That was your initiation. That was my initiation. Let me tell you something Joe Walsh and Levon Helm were my initiation into rock and roll. There's no question about it. Once they did that to me, then I really learned what rock and roll was about. <laughs> and so, David, to that point, okay, this is what I find fascinating. So you have this, and for viewers and listeners, it's this, this secret sauce that is elusive for you. I mean, you have, you need to have possibly family support because you're on the road and you're, you know, with these rock stars that sort of no holds barred. Then you have, you went from sports to promoting to, so what is that vision to, I mean, David Geffen, you were the playbook for David Geffen, I think, for packaging, for talent. So. What is this secret sauce that you have or this creativity that is so, can you, can you grab it? Like, what is it for you? Not David Geffen, but it's more like these festivals today. And I don't want to be here to take credit, but I was the first one to put together four bands, like Happy Together, four or five bands and tour them and tell them to only play hit songs. Um, that I'm going to take credit for. I mean, Dick Clark, he used to take a bus caravan of stars, but I actually took bands on the road um, and created these tours that telling them to only play package, you know, to only play hit songs. And um, there were happy together tours. And where this came from was when I was working in the Catskills and we used to go to comedians. I worked for a company called Charlie Rapp and he'd go to comedians like Henny Youngman and he'd say, OK, I'm going to pay you 50 shows. I'm going to book in a bungalow colony, which is a place where, you know, it's a little Catskill place. We saw Dirty Dancing to a hotel you're going to open for tom jones one night you're going to play a bar and i'm going to give you 50 shows 
during the summertime and you're going to work these places. So, you know, Henny would open open up a Tom Jones, the Concord, and then run run over to a, a little bungalow colony and do an act. So, you know, I saw packaging in there and uh, that was really my, you know, my my thoughts for, you know, putting all these bands on the road together. Before we get into talking about uh, the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp and the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, the movie, um, I'd be interested in knowing, David, you, what did you get out of that for yourself? You, you said that earlier in the sports marketing, this uh, sports agency business, you know, you, your real inner soul wasn't, wasn't receiving what it needed. What were you getting out of uh, promoting rock and roll? Passion is my number one, number one thing. So like when people ask me, oh, man, aren't you upset you're, when a, you're not a sports agent anymore? And these guys are making hundreds of million dollars. I, I, I love watching the sport, but I lost my passion. And I think I think that's really the, the, the story behind me is is passion. And um, I even lost passion to go on the road. And, and not working in the all-star band. I lost passion. Uh, you, you know, when I lose passion with something, um, because family is important to me, I got married and I have two kids. And I just said, uh, you know, uh, I, for my, I had three previous children, three kids from my previous marriage. And I just said, I want to be around the kids and be able to do homework with them. So that led me not to go on the road anymore. Um, hmm. So what, what moves me is passion. And to this day, I have to say it's the number one, number one thing. And, and I, and I will elaborate a little bit more during COVID when, when the live music business was, was basically shut down. We, we didn't have jobs. No one, no one got to work. I created a Zoom um, program where people could talk to rock stars and campers and producers and they could call in and talk to these rock stars. And we had everyone from sticks to Roger Dolce to Joe Elliott, to, you, you name it. I had an amazing amount of people, 160 classes. The common denominator of every one of these people that we interviewed on Zoom um, was passion and the song. Two things. Passion and the passion song. song. So, so, David, what's your passion right now? Okay, so my passion now is rock camps because I literally found a way to change people's lives through music. Slowly, slowly, but surely, but... I'm in, I, that's really what I do. I mean, um, and what keeps it going is I wake up every morning with a new idea for new camps. So I get to do something new and fresh all the time. So, um, you know, this weekend I'm doing Phil Lesh of the Grateful Dead. I never did a, a, a jam band camp. This is, I, was, I woke up this morning and said, you know, this is going to be fun. I'm not a fan of the music, but I'm going to get into it and I'm going to learn it. And I'm going to be able to hang out with these people and just understand what makes them you know, what makes them tick? I mean, you know, just like Kevin, when he gets to do a story all the time, he gets to research it and then he gets into it. So I think that to me, it's, it's creating a new camp. After that, I'm going to do a Beatles Stones, Beatles versus Stones with, um, Chuck Lavelle and Ace Freely and uh, the Kiss. And, and, and then I, and I have from Wilco and Nels Klein. I mean, I'm putting all these artists together, 80 campers coming. And in the end, I'm going to change these people's lives and not only the campers, but the rock stars. So when the, when the, when the, when the, when the guy like Phil Lush comes to, to camp, um, this, this weekend and while he thinks he's coming and just going to jam with these bands and get a paycheck, I guarantee he walks away. He's going to get affected by jamming with these campers. Yeah. Well, that is my. Next question, and that is that we are all aware of the persona of the long black limousine, the guys in the back, not often doing things that are probably illegal, but they are standoffish. A lot of them won't give you an autograph for the time of the day. Why are these rock? And we're talking big Roger Daltrey, you mentioned, um, Nancy Wilson um, from Heart. Um, I played with Dickie Betts when I visited your camp. I mean, that, I was like playing with my hero for crying out loud. Why are these people coming to your camp? They don't need to teach campers. I mean, what, what are they doing there and what do they get out of it? So I have pictures. If I have pictures on them, I automatically get them. No, seriously. <laughs> uh, 
and, 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 that's it. That's it. <laughs> that's a, that's, that's the, the secret sauce. sauce. That's the secret <laughs> sauce. Okay. So let me tell you, it's the hardest thing to get people to come and jam with these people. I mean, it's not, it's first of all, it's taking them out of their comfort zone. Um, it's a lot of work um, because, you know, they're used to doing their show and they know exactly the song list, what they're going to do. Here's what they get out of it. First of all, so when they come to camp, the first time I really, I, I, I'll, I have to admit, I have to, you know, pry them to get, come there. And, and, and the beginning was really hard. But when they start coming back, like a guy like Joe Perry has been back four times for Roger Daltrey, eight times. Um, Stone Devil Pilots coming back for the fourth time. Obviously, there's Simon. something they're getting out of it. Simon Kirk, they're getting something out of it. You're right. What are they getting? So what they're getting is it reminds them what it was like when they first started. And um, so, I, th- I mean, that's what I heard from Roger Daltrey. I heard from Nancy Wilson. She said, David. She said, you know, when we first started in the music business, it was about the music. And then once we made it, it became about lawyers, agents, managers, disagreements. Your camp is pure music. So Joe Perry, uh, he's one of the sweetest guy in the world. He he comes back to camp because he feels something. And, and I remember he wrote me a thank you letter. Oh, Kim Thale from Soundgarden. He's coming to my next camp. I was telling someone yesterday, he wrote me a two-page letter telling me, how amazing the experience was. And he only asked him to come for two, three hours. He stayed for three days and he hung out with all the campers. Nick Mason also hung out for four days with all the campers. because He wanted to play other people's music. Everybody gets something else out of it, but they definitely walk away with something out of it or they wouldn't do it. And you, you said Nick Mason? Point, Nick Mason from Pink Floyd. I mean, he came. He Mason? Nick Mason from Pink Floyd. He's the richest, ah. he's the richest rock star. You know, the guy who's smart, invested in planes and uh, planes and cars. And Nick Mason yeah. came to my camp and he stayed for four days. And he, then he said, call me, do you mind if I write an article in GQ magazine about it? And I said, no, not at all. And he wrote a beautiful expose. You know, he, he saw these people, you know, he saw these people trying. It's not a meet and greet. They're really playing the music and they... It, it, it really does have a, 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 you know, Sam Hager says in the film, he says it's the hardest thing I ever had to do. But um, Slash, I mean, I asked him to come in for two hours. He stayed for 12. He, he jammed an hour with each band. You know, once they're there and they start playing music, they put on their pants like we all do, you know, and, and they <laughs> love playing music. It's well, and, the, the and, music. The fact, and the fact that you're bringing so much joy to the campers and not only in that oh. moment or in the experience, but the fact that they're leading up to. So I saw your film and I just, for the viewers and listeners, cause I know what they're doing. They're taking like, what, what, what band camp, what, what, what? So share with them what exactly it is. And then just a couple of amazing magical stories of the campers. Cause they are so inspiring. I cried. I laughed. Like oh. it, it was a great film. We, we could have done, we could have picked a thousand campers. They all had a story. They all had a story of passion or a reason to come. And uh, the stories are just unlimited. But um, they come to camp for four days. Um, we, you know, place them in a band um, with, with a like-minded band, like-minded counselor, um, people on their level as best as you can. You know, Kevin, you get the call. He can only do an hour to film the TV, you know, so we get to put him in a day before. But, uh, but those people, they stay the whole, they're there the whole time and they're preparing songs. And um, and I, and I think that what they're going through is really a life changing experience because what happens is is it, it their lives are, it reminds them what it was like when they were children too. So I did a, a a program that changed my life, and I try to really copy what I learned. I did a thing called the Hoffman Process, and I don't know if you heard of it, but it's really amazing. Hoffman Institute. I went away for seven days and no phones, everything, just focused on me, and I and I really try to. You know, tell my campers, you know, shut off your phones, just get into this. And eventually the years start coming back and the happiness starts coming because not only they're jamming with their idols, but they're playing songs and music. Um, and it reminded where they were when they were in first grade and before they had any, any issues that they had to work about and worry about and family and just have fun for themselves. You have a favorite song? I want to know where love is. I guess, yeah, Lou Graham. Yeah, that's really? a great song. 
That's a great I song. I just love Oh, no. Okay. That song. And then the other <laughs> one is from Mike and the Mechanics on The Living Years. And I had a beautiful relationship with my father. So it was really the opposite. That song, that song could make me cry. The Grammy Award winning The Living Years. And I tell you something. <clears throat> I, I had, um, I'm in the, I'm in London doing a camp at Abbey Road Studios. And, um, the fellow who, who sings that song. Oh man, I can't forget. He was the lead singer of Mike and the Mechanics. I'll think of it. And a lady was coming to camp. Oh, you're telling me camp stories. I've got to tell you answer. And this, well, this is a story. And this lady, um, she was telling me that she doesn't talk to her father and her father's a best friends with Nick Mason. That's how eventually I got Nick Mason, but she never talked to her father again. And I called up the guy who who, who, um, who sings that song. And I said, you got to do me a favor. Can you come speak at camp tomorrow? I'm doing this rock camp here. And he came. And then I said, will you sing the song to this lady? And he sang it to her. And, um, and she cried. And then at the end, she called her father and they reunited. And um, her father uh, told Nick Mason the story about rock and roll fantasy camp. And that's how I got Nick to come. So uh, that's a great story. I mean, the stories are incredible. I mean, from a, from a guy stopping me on the street one day and saying, Mr. Fishoff, I just got back from uh, Russia. I said, what happened? He says, my band opened for Aerosmith. Your band opened for Aerosmith? He says, yeah. He says, I was at camp three months ago. And um, I wrote right after camp, I wrote to um, the, the man- Joe Perry's manager and I said, you know, my band has a lead singer, lives in Moscow. And uh, could we be possibly considered to be the opening band when Aerosmith's going to be in Moscow in three months? And she said, well, send me the CD. He sent the CD, showed it to Joe. And she said, you know, you met this camper in, in a rock camp in, in, um, in Foxwoods. And he said that uh, he wants to open. He said, let him open. And the guy opened for Aerosmith. I mean, you know, stories <laughs> like that, people meeting their wives. It, it's everyday stories, everyday stories. And, yeah. and, and really mir- miracle stories, I mean, miraculous yeah. stories. And, and, um, there was a camper once who, who, um, I was walked into a room and he was writing lyrics to a song and Rudy Sarzo was his counselor. And Rudy said to him, uh, he wanted to write a song and his son was uh, driving in a car and, um, and got, and was drunk and, and, and they got, they both died, son and, and his best friend. And the guy came to camp and he wanted to write a song about it. And um, he goes and writes the lyrics. I walk into a room and Roger, I introduce him. I see this guy there and Roger, I'm showing Roger Dolce around the studios and he's writing the song and he's telling us about the song and he doesn't realize it's Roger Dolce next to me. You know, Roger is much shorter and he was just focused on the song. Roger walks into his band about an hour later and um, he tells the story. I wrote the song. Would you sing it with him? Roger grabs him, hugs him, hugs him and says, let go, let go, let go. And he held the guy for like five minutes. And, and the guy said it was, you know, he le- learned to eventually let go. And um, I mean, you see such emotional stories at camp um, and you see fun stories. And, you know, so it, it's really it's quite interesting. It, it, you know, it's really it's a magical place. It really is a magical place. And it's not because of me, but it's because the combination of the rock stars with their, with their, um, their fans. Hmm. Wow. And the film is an extension of that. The film's an extension, you know, Jeff Rowe and Doug Blush, they, Jeff Rowe worked at VH1 for many years, knew my brand, called me up one day and says, Hey, you know, I want to do a documentary on, on, on rock camp. And I said, um, okay, great idea. I said, I don't want to be in it. I said, you know, you, you could do it and, and, and tell the story about the kids and, and about the adults, not the kids, tell the adults and some kids and, and tell the story of the rock stars and there's enough material here. And uh, I, I don't want to be. In. And, you know, when I was around Ringo all those years, you know, an interview would come in and he would say, oh, uh, uh, give it to Nils, give it to somebody else. You know, he always wanted to push everybody else and because he wanted to be part of a band. And that's where really, really where I am. I, the last thing I want to do is let it be about them. And, and then after two years of them writing the film and trying to get it done, um, they interviewed a guy from Disney. He said, where's David in the film? And he said, he doesn't want to do it. He, says, he calls me up. He's David, you have to be part of this film. And, um, I said, I'll do it on a couple of conditions. You know, number one, I want my parents, you know, and, um, I had my conditions in there, but, um, and, and thank God, you know, the film came out great. We just got back from Columbus, Ohio, and we won a film festival there. And, um, it's been fun. It's been fun. 
I um, and David. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, Kev. No, go ahead. <laughs> We're so Canadian, Kev. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, David. I did a camp in Toronto. <laughs> yes, I know you're in Toronto. Wow. Uh, David, we ask our uh, guests every week why they believe in people. I mean, we have an idea as to why you do, but just if you could articulate that, why do you believe in people? You know, my dad was a Holocaust survivor and he survived Auschwitz and Buchenwald. And every year I read a book called The Yellow Star that was written by one of his uh, bunkmates in, in, in the Holocaust. And these two, these five guys um, from a city called Bratislava get caught in different places and they'd meet in the bunk in Auschwitz. And it was their story about survival and how they survived. And, and my father survived because of his humor, um, his friendship with these five guys. They kept their observing their, their Jewish holidays, whether it was the Hanukkah and they found oil. When my father said, I got on the floor and I found cigarette butts so that I could, um, and make cigarettes, exchange flour so I could make the matzah on, on Passover with water on t- and put it on top of a plane factory at Buchenwald and celebrate the holiday. And I said, wow, I imagine these guys, they still had belief in God and they still um, believed in the religion and they believed in people. And, it, and, and you know, it, it, they had to keep warm. So they had to hug each other every night and sleep in the same, you know, cot with a cot that was sleeping in barracks. And you know, I love people. And, you know, while I'm not a musician, um, I really dig people. I dig people that are cool and they're honest. And, and, um, and that's really, you know, a lot of basic people out there. And I learn from them. I have to say, I am a, a, I suck in everything I can from, especially from these rock stars, you know, uh, you know, they have so much, they, they've been around the world and, um, they, they've seen everything. And I wrote a book years ago called uh, Rock Your Business. And it was everything I learned from, from being around these people. And they're all like 10, 12 years older than me. Um, but they've experienced life a little bit more than I have. So mm-hmm. you can learn a lot from people. And the campers. Well, the campers are great. Just, just before we let you go, because our time's almost up. But um, I have to ask, first of all, it is great to hear you talk about the the power and the healing power of music, which is what you are all about and uh-huh. what everything is all about. And that, but it is amazing. You know, if I'm, if I'm feeling, if I'm not in a good mood or something, just put it on the Spotify and find the music you like. I mean, we're so lucky. Yeah. Music has that. It's so powerful. Mm. Now, everyone's going to be asking Amy and I this. So before we let you go, what is Ringo like? <laughs> <laughs> You know, again, I met him. I met him. You know, he's he's it's open. It's open. You know, he's on a twelve step program. First of all, uh, I think the thing I admire most about Ringo, you know, twelve steps and um, is 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 great for him, and and he's a real believer of that. I think what I love most about Ringo is his marriage to Barbara. I mean, he's so dedicated, and I, I you know, I here I was, uh, I was a divorce, I was divorced, and. I saw his marriage to ring to Barbara and his dedication to Barbara and, and her dedication to him. And that's really what motivated me to get married again. I said, I, I can get this. I, I can get this. And you got to put the work in. And I, I think that to me is the most remarkable thing about him. Um, and also, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy being a Beatle. You know, everybody wants your picture. Everybody wants to grab at you all the time. Um, and like you were saying earlier about these rock stars, um, you know, they, they run out of the, the venues. No one gets to meet them. And, you know, that's what makes can't be unique because no one really get, got to meet these rock stars. The country people. Oh, Kenny Chesney. I love my people. I kiss them. I hug them. They come to my bus at five o'clock and, you know, before a show. And, you know, and, and the country people, they love their people and they hug them. The rock stars, they run away from them. So but going back to Ringo, I think I think what I really enjoyed is watching his marriage to Barbara as being that he's a Beatle. And, um, his love for his children and uh, his priorities in life. Yeah. Thanks, David. Thank you yeah. so much for coming on. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate wow, it. So, oh God, I, you know, Kevin's one of my favorite people. I'm gonna. I it. know. I, I love. <laughs> Kevin. He's adorable, you know, isn't he? He's just so adorable. I, he's adorable, <laughs> and he's so real. 
He's so real. And, and I remember his first appearance at Rock Camp and him smiling and coming out of there. And I appreciate our friendship and love to see where he is all around the world. I'm sorry he retired, but I guess he's happy. He's not retired. You're right. He's doing this. I guess I, guess I haven't <laughs> retired, Dave. <laughs> I wouldn't let him. Retire. I said, okay, as soon as he retired, all right, Kevin, we're doing this. 38 years we've been friends, David. And it's like, all right, dude, we're doing this. Kevin, I'm going to leave you with this story. My father was 80 years old and, and he was a cantor and he made $10,000. He goes to the president of the synagogue and he says, my next contract, you're going to negotiate with my agent, my son, and he's going to represent me. And they all knew me around the giants and everything. He said, okay, have David call me. And um, I call a guy up and he says, come see me, David. He says, we can't afford the cantor anymore in the synagogue. You know, we're, we're a poor synagogue. And I said, stop right here. I'm going to write you a check for $10,000. And you'll give my father your 10 and this 10 and, uh, you know, you'll, you'll keep him going. He doesn't want to retire. He loves working. He, it's the most thing that what keeps his mind going, his voice going. I go home. He says, OK, David, that's fair. And I go home and I see my mother and my father. And my father walks in. So, no, no, what happened? What happened? I said, Dad, I doubled your salary. He yells at my wife, my mother in Yiddish. He said to her, he said, I should have used them all the time to do my contracts. <laughs> so, so, so I saw the power, uh, the power of of not working and not giving up, of keeping your mind going. You know, that's what's great about rock and roll fantasy camp. You know, unlike these baseball camps, the, these guys they show up at forty five, fifty, they can't hit the ball of the fence. Mick Jagger is still going, Ringo is still going, McCartney is still going, The Who is still going. You know, it's 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 that love that um, it's the love of people. It's love to entertain people, whatever it is, and to have an effect on people's lives. So th this is great. You know, Kelly, you're you still working on it. You're going to affect on people's lives. And that's really what it's about. It's, you know, you know, my favorite saying is that in 100 years from now, it won't make a difference how much money you have, what kind of car you can drive, but only in what you've done in the life of a child. And so, you know, strip it all away. That's, that's really my goal in life. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for Enjoy. having me. All the best. Thank okay, all the best. So Thank you. Come to camp, Kevin. You I'll see you down the camp, road. You come to. Okay, I promise me. Okay, thanks. Well, Kevin, you know what really inspires me? With David, it reminds me of that motivation starts within us. That, you know, no matter what he saw, not only opportunities, but he opened his eyes to the possibilities. You know, he transitioned from sports agent to music and he, you know, and he, you know, he doesn't even play an instrument, but yet he just saw something. And really, he likes the connection. And he's doing this to connect rock stars and us, you know, us mere mortals to be able to jam and and uh, be inspired and empowered. So he's really something. I don't think he realizes how uh, empowering he is. He believes in people. You said that. You said that and, and the history of his his family's his family and and the you know the terrible travails of his father that his father went through and then despite all that he tells us the story that not only his father but himself uh, believe in people believe in the power of people and obviously the power of music and believe me if he's promoting aerosmith uh, then he will have had his eardrums blown out by the power of music and if you believe in people, well, then this is the podcast for you. Please subscribe to Believe in People and uh, listen to us. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you.